Anyway, uh, my name is Francisco Science. Uh, first, I have to say I'm humbled by all of your projects and your presentation. Um, they're so cool to see how I do. So, my project is to design and optimize a development board for use with a mobile imaging system. So, a 3D scanner. Um, the general objective of the project is to have a mobility device, something about the size of your phone, uh, and uh, have a reference device that I did not work on. And so have these two devices communicate, and then have the mobility device move around the uh, move around the uh, the reference device and know its position um, through cameras. The sensors will be the position sensor will be cameras. And so my tiny part in this project was to design a mobility a mobility device, something like this. And I'll pass it around in a second. Most of you have seen it already. Uh, my project goal is to select a microcontroller. Uh, in the camera combo. So this device over here is two devices, well actually three, and uh, create the interface between the two devices and then test the, uh, the data acquired. This was, uh, if I had time uh, after the interface, I was gonna try to test the data and see that, I, that it was actually useful to find its position, at least in one dimension, which is what I did. Uh, after that, as for my advisor, I had to share the results um, with online community. Here's why. So when I got introduced to the project is, I'll talk about that later. Uh, when I got introduced to the project, um, the minute after that, I went on the internet and, and tried to find who already uh, did this, right? Who already uh, worked with a camera and a microcontroller. So a camera spits information at a very high rate and microcontrollers usually cannot handle it. So. I went with my advisor and I told her I, I can't do this. Um, the, the board itself is around $400, uh, cheapest, that could handle this rate, I, I can't. And she said, fine, you'll do a little toy that flies. And uh, she knew which buttons to push. I immediately went back on my computer and I said, no, now I'm gonna do this thing. However, I had constraints, right? I had time, it took me three months just to uh, I, I kept on doing what I call the multiplication. I kept on uh, multiplying uh, data I was going to take for a frame, uh, how many, how uh, often I wanted these frames, and how much memory uh, I needed to do. And then I would try to go to uh, go on the market and find what microcontroller could handle this. And I kept on getting really expensive microcontrollers. Um, and then it was mobility, so it could be done if I had webcams and a computer, and I and I moved the computer, the webcam around. It could be done. Uh, Faster, uh, but because of the mobility, I was introduced to computing power budget uh, and computing power and uh, power budget, um, and finally the cost of it all. I couldn't go and buy a five hundred dollar uh, board, so I chose to work with what we had. Uh, we had uh, an OB seven seven six seventy correct um, camera module, which is I'm going to break my project, uh, which is this thing here, and so. This thing is around $10 online. The lab I was working with already had a few, and I decided to pick it. Now, um, they went with uh, specifications they had already found. They found that uh, it could uh, you could retrieve VGA images from it, and they were thinking RGB and up to 30 frames per second on this device. So then I went onto the internet again and tried to find people who had already interfaced this specific camera, and I did. I found I found about three. Most of them had done it with expensive ports and were not sharing any of their information. Uh, however, I went on to look into color spaces, image color spaces, and I found that I did not need RGB, although I can't because I just needed a grayscale image. Although I can get a grayscale image from RGB by simply uh, taking average of that, that takes computing power from the microcontroller. I was not going to do that. So I chose to use YUV um, color space. And there was a reason why I took this camera. The Y channel is simply light intensity. And that gives me numerical data for every pixel on the image. And then I went for a microcontroller. Um, I like the Arduino because I had worked with it. I've just been working with it for years. And I really didn't want to program in anything else. Again, everything available online was mostly for um, other microcontrollers or Apple microcontrollers in other platforms. 
I like this one because it has 54 digital uh, inputs and outputs. I needed a lot of them for, for the camera. Um, 16 analog inputs, I really didn't need any analog, but for the final project, I was gonna need sensor data, and it could, have been, it could be an analog um, sensor. So that's that. And then it has three serial ports. So for external communication with either my reference device or a computer or any other thing, I was gonna need serial communication. This device has three ports and has enough RAM, and it has a 16 megahertz clock, and it's relatively inexpensive and readily available. I have it. And about the 16 megahertz clock, I'll explain a little later. So here, most of my project you can't see because it's in here and it's code. Um, I that uh, little image going over there is my code, and it's 709 uh, lines of code. And what, what they do is. They interface the OV7670 uh, digital uh, camera module with the Arduino microcontroller. Now, uh, I found several versions of software like this online, or actually I found one user uh, that had several versions of this software online. He wasn't available for communication. He had his code there. So I took part of his code and I added my code into it, um, mainly a library he had and for communication. Uh, and what did not compile in the beginning. So I spent most of my first semester thinking about using another camera, another microcontroller, and buying expensive machines. Uh, but then during the summer, I got it to work. And as soon as I came here, my friend Luis Martinez here saw that what I was doing is I was taking the first line of the image, and then I was making a complete matrix with that same line, so it looked messy. Uh, I, it took me 20 minutes to explain the code to him, and then it took him five to tell me, you need an extra space over here. Uh, and after that space, it spit the whole, uh, uh, I could retrieve the whole matrix, put it into MATLAB, tell it to show me the image made up from this matrix, and it worked. Uh, so what the code does is, or the 16 megahertz is important because that provides the, provides a waveform that the camera needs to operate, right? And then it has an interrupt so that whenever the camera is ready to submit or to send a frame, the computer starts, or the microcontroller starts reading it. And then it sends it over serial when it's told to, and then it does it all right. It's what I had to do after that, the first picture I took, I took with that device. That was my setup. The, green board in the middle of it all, buried in all those cables is the Arduino. The OVC, uh, the camera is on that side, on my left. And then I needed uh, the boards, like the, the, the uh, color resistors and whatnot. I did that, but again, this had to be a mobility thing, and I could not um, have it and you know, move it like that. Plus, I was terrified that a cable would, um, that a cable would, go away and, and this thing will work. So I designed a circuit. Went on to Eagle. I had never used this software before. I went on to Eagle. I designed that. This is a double layer uh, circuit. And I asked a friend who has a CNC machine um, to, to cut it for me. Or to, yeah, to cut it for me. And this is the circuit I designed. Um, I made a, a couple of uh, modifications because it cannot be done uh, in a double layer with the CNC machine. I bought that for five dollars in Radio Shack, and he and he engraved it with this machine. That made this dish bubble, which is this other one. I probably should have sent it on too. Um, so that's my finished product. Now I had to, and I and I could already get data. I got that data. So those are a lot of numbers um, that show the light intensity in a matrix. That, in fact, is a part of Jose Puente's face and numerically. That's how it looks. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so that's how it looks. Uh, right, 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 yeah. You don't look pretty there either. Um, anyways, then I took it to MATLAB, right? I, took, I wrote a MATLAB code, and to, to take this, to retrieve this image from, from the device, to display the image if I wanted to. And then I went on to those steps. Filtering, uh, I, I uh, constructed a Gaussian filter. Edge detection, I used Canny uh, analysis algorithm. I'll explain that. And then calibration and positionals in 1D. I just did 1D because I just wanted to validate this data. Um, 
algorithm. So I'll explain. Here, that's the original image uh, I shot. That is an image of a picture frame that my, uh, an empty minute picture frame that my sister hung up my wall and said, uh, go graduate already. I'll put your diploma there. Um, and so, and so that's the original image. Then I filtered it. I, I put a Gaussian filter on it. What a Gaussian filter does is it takes spots or it takes every spot in the picture and it creates a, it takes an average of the value of those, of those, uh, of those pixels, right? And then it creates that. What that does, it helps me take, uh, get rid of a uh, high frequency noise and oh, just smooth this image. Then I did edge detection, Canny. Uh, Canny is a method, uh, John F. Canny devised that in 1981 or so. And he basically takes uh, radical changes in, in color and it displays them, right, in black and white. So only zeros and one now, it binarizes my image. However, uh, because of the camera, it takes, it has this huge image over there, uh, or this huge edge over there, and whenever I wanted to do the measurement, it was gonna measure the top, the big one, right? And that's used as a spinning list. And because the end product was only going to work in, in the uh, infrared light, uh, that was not gonna be a problem. So uh, it, is, it, is a, it is valid to take that away. Then I just have to do that. I'm currently really, uh, anyway. So all I have to do is I then measured the uh, the width of the known width of that uh, of that of that frame. Uh, the operation it tells me the pixel width. And then it asks me whether it's calibration or not. It calculates the focal length. And then you know I get to choose that. I, I program that in MATLAB. The results, this is only my best result. At a measure distance of 2.55 meters, the algorithm computes 256.25 uh, centimeters. So about 0.5% error. However, I have to say, this is my best result, and I did it, I did it, uh, this, this is my best result. The average is around 6% result, and if, if you go a, a more dramatic change, um, it, can be, it can be fixed. So future work, if any, body wants to continue in the project is to uh, port the precision algorithms, whatever I programmed in MATLAB, into the uh, MCU, into the microcontroller unit, establish communication with the reference device through the ports I mentioned before, and integrate an arbitrary sensor port, which I think somebody did already. Um, as knowledge jokes, I have to, uh, uh, my advisors, uh, Dr. Mario Diaz and Dr. Cristina Torres, Jose Puente for letting me know about the project and helping me out, Iran, Iran Lerma for uh, the PCB machine, and Luis Martinez for that life-saving line of code. Thank you. Any questions? You mentioned that there was a space you had to place in to go ahead and get the the image to go ahead and properly display. What do you mean? Uh, when uh, you had your uh, your f the first uh, line of the picture, the first line of pixels. Oh. You so, had to put a space. So in my code, yeah, in my code, this is it's it's really that in my code, I I had a function that is called a. I remember it's an image retrieving uh, uh, function that basically uh, it pinged the, the actually it did it it read every every pulse that the camera had to had to shoot right but the thing is what I was doing is it would get the first one store the first one and then keep getting or create a create a matrix with this first line so it just repeat the line mm -hmm. when I actually when I told the computer when I told the computer give me color bars I, I changed it so that it give me color bars. It would give me perfect color bars, and I was excited. But then when I told it, give me an actual picture, it wouldn't. How did I know it was alive? By covering it. I covered the camera, and I told it to give me a picture. It gave me a black thing. I was like, OK, that's perfect. And then I put it onto a light, and it was white. So I was like, OK, I got something. But it's not displaying an image. The way it did it is uh, he, he, uh, I had two loops in that, in that uh, function, and he spaced that loop. He, he said, skip one line, he added a counter to it. Or actually, the counter was in place. He made use of the counter and told it to skip a line every time, mm -hmm. and then it created the huge matrix. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So when you do the PCB board, uh, why did you use a CNC machine to machine it? Why don't you use a chemical thing to etch it? I did that because if you see if you see the the leads in the in the uh, device, uh, there was seven there was seven mm -hmm. leads that were going to go actually eight. Uh, Total of 20, but eight leads that were going to go into the camera, and they're very, very close together. If I did chemical, it was gonna—I I was afraid it was gonna—it was gonna spill over and, and you know, 
take off part of that. But that is why I used it. Uh, I could I could have done uh, chemical, and actually it was it was would have been faster to do that because things are here as opposed to sending it. It took a day or two uh, to the PC uh, to the CNC machine, but I think it's a pretty cool result. In my any other questions? <laughs> I think Mary. Yeah? What do you, what do you send to Electrical. What do you send to that level? Do you, do you send to that level? Uh huh. No, 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 no. I, I, I created a serial monitor in MATLAB. Oh, okay. So as opposed to using the serial monitor provided in the IDE, I created my own so that I could just use MATLAB instead of using several different pieces of hardware. Oh, uh, software. 2015 A. With the, Im yeah, the, the image toolboxing, yeah. Okay, so the, the last question, okay? We got to move on. I had a question. I want to come back to an interesting approach to engineering. It seems to avoid heavy, um, heavy original work. Um, and you did a very good job of, of putting together searches on internet, very creative searches for what you needed to get done to piece each little individual thing together to, to make it all fit in a very nice way. So congratulations for that. Fascinating. So what happens is actually the I, I did I did say uh, well the parts I couldn't I cannot design uh, a camera or a microcontroller. Right. I did design the circuit myself and the code I wrote myself. I said And the code, that's right. So which is the interface, the, all of the code, the MATLAB and the uh, microcontroller code. So what I said is there was different approaches on the internet um, with different hardware, none of none of the approach. In fact, I counted how many people had done it in the internet, and I'm the fifth one to do it in all of the internet. Um, and so, yeah, pretty original work. I did cheat. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, one. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jose Puente. Uh, I'm presenting here my project, which is to design an optimized um, optical reference device to use with a 3D measuring system. So, uh, in order to better describe my project, I have to describe what photogrammetry is. Uh, what is photogrammetry? What well, is the technique of measuring objects with a camera and de determine their relative position or distance? Within a certain degree of action. Why is photogrammetry important? Well, if you're a drone that wants to navigate without the aid of GPS, you can use an optical reference device, perform some photogrammetry, and find out your relative position within that object. Or uh, if you're using a virtual reality headset and you want to enhance the user experience, you can use photogrammetry by putting these images rub into your uh, optical reference device and have a better experience. Or you can do landscapes. You can fly by an airplane, take several pictures of the object, and then plot it in 3D. So my project goals was to determine the device reference geometry, uh, also build the optical reference device. Now, determine also the uh, parameters to build a uniform LED sphere, test the sphere obviously, and integrate uh, full duplex communication, meaning that to develop a protocol that could talk to the camera and the beacon and exchange information in real time. Uh, in order to measure anything with a camera, obviously you have to know the parameters. Uh, you have to know the object length, obviously. The, the distance at which you are from the object, and some intrinsic parameters for the camera, which are field of view and the resolution of the camera. So based on that information, I put together uh, this uh, model code. Uh, it's nothing more than uh, the relationship between similar triangles from the object and the camera, and express that function as nothing more than the tangent ratio of the object and the parent size that I have in the camera. Uh, this, this is a simulation. Uh, this represents uh, an object uh, being looked at 100 meters 
for a given resolution, any given resolution up to uh, 5,000 pixels, uh, the distance of the object, and the field of view of the camera. So we want to know uh, what's the geometry of the device you need to make. You have to look at this graph and pick up the values of the resolution of the camera, field of view, and the distance between the object. Well, based on that, I put in the first prototype. Uh, it's three, four LEDs separated by a distance that is constant. Uh, the LEDs at the bottom are separated by 100 degrees each. The other one is uh, orthogonal to the bottom. And then I perform something that's called optical track. This is a video of the beacon being looked at as you move away. As you can tell, there's deformations in the object. At some points, uh, some of the LEDs doesn't show up because the middle bar interferes with that. And if you can clearly tell uh, the light of these LEDs, you see some dispersion patterns. Well, in order to fix that dispersion pattern, um, I needed to construct an object that could provide a uniform uh, intensity of light. Based on that, uh, turns out the University of Zacatecas in Mexico had already developed a model that will determine how many LEDs you need for an sphere of given radius. Uh, and how many degrees between each other each LED you need to use in order to create the most uniform uh, intensity of light. On the left, you see how an LED looks like. They are not perfect. They have this uh, flower pattern that is intrinsic to LEDs due to aberrations and optical aberrations, refraction, and diffraction. And the parameters of the plastic that which are made of. So, um, Obviously, UTV doesn't have a device to measure light, so I have to construct one myself. Uh, what you see here is nothing more than a microcontroller connected to a photoresistor and an LED that is attached to two servos. Each servo moves 180 degrees in one axis, uh, let's say X, and the other one moves 180 degrees in Y axis. So what I do is I attach the LED to servos and rotate the servos in each axis measure that intensity, value, and play. So the servo's rotating, uh, the photos are just on the top. However, I have to filter the light of the environment. Uh, we do not have a dark chamber, so I have to come up with an innovative, cost-efficient solution. What well, for that, HGV was really helpful <laughs> to give me this box for free. <laughs> so I put my entire design inside this cover box, turn up the lights, and let the magic happen. Uh, the theory of, from University of Zacatecas tells you that if you put two LEDs separated at uh, 8 degrees from each other, you will see something like that. If they're separated from each other at 7 degrees, you will see something like that picture. But if you put them at 6 degrees from each other, you would have an almost perfect distribution of light. So based on that, I got the results of what I obtained with my device, and you can tell that they somewhat match the results, given the degree of accuracy that I hired, that, that I got, which was everything brought the, the servos together inside a cardboard box. It, it cost me two dollars to make this. So based on that, then I can build my LED sphere. So I put together this CAD model of a sphere, and then print it with the help of a friend. However, you can tell there's still uh, these uh, variations of light on the side. It's not perfect, right? But then I find out that if I'm looking at an object, we, we, went, we wanted to look at this beacon at a distance of half a meter to 10 meters. So I find out that I do not need an extremely big object with a lot of intensity. I find out that one of the is just fine. So I got this LED. Uh, but in order to filter all the light, I basically put an infrared filter. How do you find an infrared filter locally? Well, they're not readily uh, available. So it turns out, my plant of science found out that floppy disk filter infrared. So what I did is we cut the floppy disk, put it into the camera, took a picture, and plotted it with Python. Uh, you can tell that there's a lot of noise. So if I want to determine the center of that image, that value on the left will throw the value of the center. That is physically not. 
So I needed to find a solution for that, for a single LED. Well, uh, fortunately enough, for this time of the year, I went to Michael's and I saw that they had this uh, plastic LED here, which was just perfect for what I needed. So what I did is I cut them up, fill them up with oil, then throw some silicone on top on, on, inside, and then throw the LED inside. Let it cool, and then break it like a kinder egg, and obtain my price. So here is my semi-perfect infrared LED sphere, and this is the results that I get. Uh, that shade on the right is nothing more than um, the variation of light on this sphere because I'm moving it on the top, from the, from the front side. So, um, based on that, I needed to come up now with weekends that would allow me to measure distance in C and 360 uh, degree rotation on the C axis and some degree of movement in X and Y. So, I put together this design uh, that allows me to rotate in the center and move around and get my relative position with some degree of accuracy. Now, my next thing was to develop a protocol, my full duplex communication system. Or well, you want to build a communication system, you have to first look at what's out there. You can't just cherry pick something. You have to uh, justify why you pick that device. Well, what's available out there, ISM band, um, a proprietary network, very expensive. So obviously, that's out of the question. Uh, then we go to CB. Basically, uh, it's technically Wi-Fi. The frequency changes are slightly, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the price for that, okay, for a CB module, is $100. Now you have to look at the efficiency of how much current does it require. Am I going to have a device that costs, that uh, consumes two amps of current per hour just to get a reference point? Obviously not. Well, the next thing is Wi Fi and Bluetooth. Wi Fi, it would be rather expensive. Well, I can always use a router, but that increases the size of my design. So the next available thing would be the other equipment you heard. In this case, I use a zero port uh, protocol, which the maximum transfer rate is 150,000 uh, bits per second or less. It costs dollars on Amazon, and it consumes 8 million amps of it. So obviously, that would be good. Now, I have a Bluetooth module. How am I going to establish that communication? from my camera and my device. Well, I can put together this protocol, which is, I name what each position of my, my device is. Let's say A dot B is the X axis, and C is the Z axis. So that when I'm looking at the beacon in front of the camera, there are two probable options, the probable positions that you can be. Uh, you can probably, if you take a picture and you see the beacon, you can either be in front or on the back. And if you want to determine rotation, you need to know which the X and Y and Z component are. For that, you just tell the beacon, hey, give me light up on the, the X component, the X is here. Now light up on the, the Y component, then the Z component. That way I would know my rotation, whether, whether or not I'm in front of the device or on the back of the device. This is my final setup. Um, it's the beacon, I would attach the ruler. I know that this is from the center. With uh, centimeter accuracy, I'll be getting these gears connected to my uh, Arduino board and the Bluetooth module. And this is what I obtained. That picture was taken at a uh, half a meter distance from the beacon. Each side, each length of the beacon is 12 centimeters. So, based on that, I can now determine distance with some algorithms that I've been working on for the past six months. However, that's not part of my project. Um, yeah, the future work, obviously I would like to continue working on this. Um, my advisor, Dr. Christina Torres, uh, is, she's been working on this thing for the past three years. Unfortunately, uh, during the first part of the senior she passed away. So I have to continue uh, with the advisor with Dr. Maria Diaz, which I want to acknowledge. Um, and we, I basically just, she had pitched up this idea to the uh, entrepreneurship conversation center because she wanted to develop a patent, a device that could have commercial applications, right? Uh, she is obviously gone, so now those rights are going to me. 
and it's my responsibility to carry the project through and to present it to the Entrepreneurship Conversation Center and hopefully we get a uh, I would like to acknowledge my friend Javier Sainz. He was uh, really helpful for the entire semester. He introduced me to Arduino, uh, teach me how to program C. That's, I appreciate that. Uh, Luis Martinez helped me a lot with code. Uh, my friend Alan Lerma, he helped me with a 3D printed. Um, and Dr. Sue for being helpful and flexible with us to allow us to have a, a different advisor at the middle of the semester. So, thank you guys. Hello guys, my name is Miguel Sainz. I'm presenting the vertical axis wave turbine, and my advisor is Dr. Dan. One source of renewable energy that has not been fully developed is the ocean waves. Uh, the World Council estimates that the energy that can be harvested from the world's ocean is equal to twice the amount of the electricity that we're producing. The objective is to develop uh, two prototypes of vertical axis wave turbine in order to extract energy from the ocean waves. The prioritize consists of a vertical and horizontal blade to optimize the blade design in order to improve the hydrodynamics. My constraints uh, are the budget, it's uh, $200, and also auto fabrication must be done using the 3D printer uh, in Edinburgh and the machine shop. And for other testing, that must be done in our current wave tank. The four types of forces that act to make a wave is the first force is the distribution force, the second force is the restoring force due to the gravity, and the third force is the inertia and mass conservation, and the fourth force is this dissipated force. The, for the vertical axis, I, I uh, got these signs from the wind turbines, uh, like, like this, and Helix shape. But in order for it to be a hydrodynamic, I use the uh, NICA 0021. The NICA is a four digit link. The first two digits describe the maximum chamber as a pertains of the core. The second digit describes the distance of, and the maximum chamber of the airfoil leaving the edge of the tenth percent of the core. And the last two digits describe the maximum thickness of the airfoil. Um, can you see the equation? No, no. no. Well, <laughs> okay. It's only there, but. <laughs> well, that's the equation used for the NACA 0021, uh, where, uh, see, the, the core length for my design was uh, three inches, as you see from here to here. Uh, the X is the position I'm on the the zero to C, and why is the thickness of the surface? And my maximum thickness is going to be 0 0.63 from the X to the to the max. This is the NICA 021 airfoil that I come out with Excel. It's in the formula that we was not show. And that I, I created this uh, two prototype. Uh, this is the first prototype that with the vertical blade. Uh, this is the shape of the vertical blade. It uh, has the NICA 021, and it's an eight inches long. And this is the horizontal blade that will be connected, as shown here, to the vertical blade. And I had to do this cut up to improve the hydrodynamic. This is the second prototype design. This is the using the helix shape. This is the helix shape, and uh, we're. Uh, Horizontal blade, I use the same design. For the 3D printing, uh, I needed to print my blades. This were the horizontal, I played all facing up using the MakerBot over there in Edinburgh. Unfortunately, the, the 3D printer was very short, like six inches. So I couldn't fix my, my blades uh, vertically. I had to put it horizontally and that damaged a little bit the, the airfoil. This is my connectors in order to connect the, the shaft with the spot, in order to connect the horizontal blades. 
It uh, has an inch in diameter and it has uh, three spots at 120 degrees and two tap holes in order to sustain it to the tap. I glue the prototype with using a two-tone epoxy and small uh, tear cans. This is the final prototype. Uh, I painted it in order to try to do it because uh, of the, uh, the printing, try to solve the issue with the NACA 021. And this is the video. It was from resting position, there I turn on the wave tank. As you can see, the waves here tonight is starting to... It's from the water tank? Yeah, from the water tank. It starts from the resting position, and I just turn it on and start to separate to show that. For my testing, I use this device, the Dr. Uh It's a spring loaded that adds friction to the plate. And in order to increase the torque, uh, and I was able to record the, the dial with degrees to to get the uh, angular velocity. Uh, but basically, it's the spring. Uh, here is the this is the spring and the, the torque that added. At uh, 1.5 inches, it's a 0.5 on force. And that's how I, I was able to get the power at uh, that uh, torque. And I get the maximum point that it was uh, uh, one and a half inches. And I that one, I took the video and put it at 30 frames per second and was able to get it at uh, least so I can get the angular velocity and got it. This is uh, my GAN chart uh, for this semester. I go really behind uh, because of the 3D printing. We are having issues. Uh, the 3D printer over there in Edinburgh broke. So it delayed me like three weeks. Or have any, any questions? Yeah. It looks like you based your design on that expression, that equation that uh, you yeah. threshold. Okay, but uh, I, may, I may have missed it. But can you try explaining how did you relate that equation to your design? How did you make that transformation, that transition to what you design on the equation? Uh, or in other words, what does that equation represent? Well, that equation represents uh, the, Na the NACA is an aerofoil used, uh, how many used for the transit color? For the hydro Or change the One. background? Two, three, one. Just highlight. Just, just everything with white. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's good? That equation is uh, <laughs> for the NICA. It's uh, coming just for the for the hydrogen. I found that equation. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's just for the comment for the air photo. And let's see who comes as the part name and like the position why the center next to the surface and T is the maximum thickness. Which in my design was a 0 0.63. What somewhere do you use to design the actual plate? Uh out of okay. Well first I put it, I put the chart in, in Excel and then for another time I went point for point. Uh, here I put more points to make it as smooth as possible, and then here just I uh, put it in AutoCAD and I'll smear it, and then just extrude it. 
to this cross section of degree specifically for the uh, for creating better you know hydrodynamic or aerodynamic performance. I think again that the only you know uh, airplanes and wings that the cross section are all uh, in, are shaped similar to this, just for better you know hydrodynamic performance. What the scale? What will be the scale for like compared to a natural cross site? I, I didn't get to that part. The idea we didn't get to in the second. Like the actual, if you want to implement it, what would be the size of it? Well, it was just a prototype to see uh, to see if it actually works and get uh, some readings. But I didn't get it. Uh, in the utility scale, it might be scaled up to like uh, um, uh, 10 feet in diameter or so in that range. Okay. Am I and this is a uh, just a, a small model for the lab testing. Uh, okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Benny. I'm going to be talking about my project on an RF 13 port, 16 port multiplexer. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start off with the introduction. Then I'm gonna talk about some applications it, it currently exists in, how I got the idea, and pretty much from there it's the design and how I struggled to get this as far as I did. So, microwaves, they're generally from 300 mega to 300 gigahertz. They're not as strong as some of the traditional frequency ranges used to, for 3D imaging, like X-rays or, or anything higher than ultraviolet rays. But, they don't have, the thing about microwaves is that they, they don't really have high ionization radiation. So it's a little bit healthier for traditional scans. Currently, there are a ton of imaging systems going on right now, from military to weapon detection and a bunch of things that pretty much keep us safe. Like I mentioned, there's, they also exist in the medical field. The only problem with these scans is that they tend to come with a lot of energy and they're very expensive. The apparatus for these things, well, you can imagine, just by looking at the MRI, that not, a, not a frequency scanner, but still very intensive energy. So where the, idea, where the idea comes from is trying to get those kind of imaging technologies in a healthier health frame. So that's where my, the microwave frequency is perfect for that. It doesn't have a high ionization radiation from those other scans. It's a, and um, it's cheaper because you could produce them with some antenna if you design them right. If we also, the project also aims to make those big apparatuses something where it's easy accessible to anybody going for a checkup maybe at the hospital. Something that's easy that they will be able to use instead of going through so much scheduling or having to put so much money into these higher end scans. It's gonna work simply through a frequency generator into some, into a, a multiplexer system with antennas and a transmitter in the middle, and then it just comes back up. It's a mirror. The antenna, transmitter, and receiver array was going to initially look like a phone with a few antennas wrapped around for multiple signals and max quality. So, my part was to make sure that every antenna was able to receive its signal with minimal loss to the signal from the input to output. <coughs> well, in regular electronics, that's called a multiplexer. With any kind of gate, you can control the truth table where exactly you want your signal to go, and vice versa. So, if this was a normal low frequency environment, it'd be easy. Just get a couple of gates, make a truth table, and voila, you got all your whatever you needed. But since it's not high frequency, I, I wanted to just relay the difference between low and high frequency. And the way I decided to do it was with the wavelength. So this simple relation here is how you can, how the wavelength can determine itself. So, 60 hertz frequency relates to a, a wavelength almost the size as the Earth radius. So when you're dealing with that kind of wavelength, the little 
circuit that you work on here won't really affect the overall quality of your signal. But when you go a little bit higher into your frequencies, that wavelength decreases immensely. So when you have a small wavelength, any ge geometry of the medium it's propagating through affects the signal. So that introduces a bunch of a bunch of factors that you have to consider. So that's where the design focus comes from. The multiplexer mostly will consist of some radio frequency switches, a laminate, which is pretty much uh, where you're gonna trace your your circuit and SMA connectors, and the microchip lines, which is the part that you design. Our switches, the laminate and SMA connectors, all come manufactured, so you just read what you need, find what you need, and utilize it. So the biggest thing for this is reducing return loss. Return loss is pretty much the accumulated loss from your signal as it, pro as it goes from input to output through whatever system you're going through. Three decibels is 50% of your signal. That was the target to stay under. And so I'll just go ahead and start with the radio frequency switches. Pretty much it's just a switch, like I said. It's switching the signal. The only thing is this is for high frequency. And the main thing that I got was insertion loss. So I, I was filtering through a bunch of switches. And the one I actually ended up with this one highlighted in this line color, uh, PT4041, max insertion loss of 1.2. So the only thing that I was noting or drawing concern from my search was that all of these radio frequency switches tend to be very, very small. So this would actually become a huge problem later on, as I'll get to, but that's just typically how they are for isolation. The laminate, uh, it's just, there's many different kinds. Uh, the one I decided to use was the thickness of 0.25 millimeters, diametric of three. This also affects your, your signal. So an SMA connector, so I'm just using standard lithium connectors. So the microstrip lines is pretty much what I was gonna be focused on for this project. I had to make sure that the design, the geometry, and everything about this microstrip perfectly matched the, the, the lowest possible insertion loss that I could get. So every microstrip line is unique. You can't use one microstrip line universally for all systems. That's just not the way it works in high frequency environments. So each come with a relation. The visual here diagram actually illustrates a good picture of how it's exactly by length, width, and these are the ways you would determine it. So I actually, when I initially started, just went through these formulas, just started calculating and got random numbers. Well, not random numbers, but numbers that I would need to get low insertion. And the way I would have to test it would run it through HXS, which I did not know how to use. So I just ran through a few simulations just to learn how to learn your software. And eventually I got these microstrip lines. You can't really see the numbers, but each one is about negative 40 decibels, around 6.3 gigahertz. So it was pretty good, but they weren't scaled to the size of the pins of the radio frequency switches. So what I decided to do was cut the edges, which changed the signal for the whole for the whole model. So I decided to reevaluate my design and actually scale my mod my models just to the pin size on the switches, so I would avoid that problem. Also, when I initially designed it, I didn't really know about high frequency, so I just made my circuit look, well, cool from what I thought, but cool doesn't really mean anything when you when your numbers don't make any sense. So those bands were really inefficient, those line segments. So I ran a line how to deal with these kind of bands, and there's actually a really common way called miter bands, which is just a ratio of 1.8 times the width of your strip. Really easy to put into the, your model. The only problem was, since I was using the pin as my basic width, all, this, all the data or all my return loss was completely thrown off. So what I decided to do was add patches onto my microstrip lines. Here are the relations of the, the patches on the width, to, width, which is cool which is, because they're interrelated between the bandwidth, the voltage, the standing volt, volts, voltage standing weight ratio, and the refraction coefficient. So that was pretty cool because I can directly calculate some numbers, put them into my model, and see how it's going to affect my overall return loss. And the best thing about it was the HFS has a variable system, 
that allows you to run multiple simulations at the same time. So it saves a ton of time. Eventually, these little models I got, each one has a unique patch different from the other, specifically to match their bandwidth. And this is the, the data that I got, mostly ranging from negative 25, which is, I think, the lowest bandwidth, the, na the lowest insertion loss I have. So it's pretty good, because I needed to hit negative 20 at stage 1, 2. So that was individually, so I needed to put them in a single model to test for cross-talking. Cross-talking is any kind of distortion that every line will pretty much Cross-logging is, um, if the lines too close to each other, just like, <laughs> you, um, they distort each other's signal. So extra resistance. So I went into the edge of the sets and ran them together. They did distort everything. And at this point, um, my edge of software decided to take a little hiatus, which is three weeks. And when it came back, I was able to actually correct everything and got my cross-logging simulation numbers right here. So the next part, which I thought was going to be the easy part, the fabrication. And these are the three methods I ended up using. And the CNC machine was easy. I just exported the file into AutoCAD, threw it into the machine, and this, that's the right there at the And this is the result it gave me. Looks good from far away, but when you zoom in and mark should level, you can see that every edge is actually rigid. And in the end, that affects the return loss ratio of increasing it. So it, it wasn't accurate enough. Next, I tried carbon etching, which pretty much makes a carbon mask when you add better chloride with copper, and it leaves you with whatever trace you had left on the copper. Well, the copper mask was pretty strong, but it left a lot of holes in between the lines, so that also wasn't the solution. So, the last method I decided to use was photo etching, etch, photo etching, resist etching which pretty much works the same as carbon etching, except you use film as your mask for the resist of the ferric chloride. We have a exposure unit here, and everything I did had to work under a red diode because any kind of light would mess up the film. So this is eventually how it looks. You put it in, you get your mask exposed to film, and that's how it looks compared to the CNC machine. It's much more accurate, but this method it's very, very unpredictable. It took me almost 50 hours of working on this process alone just to get that kind of result. And in the end, when I had my, my, my Michael ships, they were too small for any hardware we had to actually etch it. We did try testing it last night, the last minute testing, but just soldering the Michael ships with our equipment actually caused them to fall off. So. I did get in contact with someone, but it was a little bit late, so I wasn't able to actually start it. But I'm planning to, maybe in the next week, actually go and talk to him with a sponsor, and hopefully we get it done for Dr. Jim. So this is my Gantt chart. Everything got delayed. There were so many things that went wrong, but... And this part is empty because I had a partner who quit, so he wasn't able to well, obviously finish. So pretty much, the project itself is, it was pretty time consuming, a lot more than I thought it would be. The etching process was a lot harder than I thought it would be. And just the limitations of how putting everything together, because I did have all the parts, I just didn't have a way to wrap it up. So pretty much, in the next two weeks, I'm gonna go ahead and get in contact with that sponsor and hopefully get it etched out and have a model working for Dr. Uh, any questions? Very fast to buy a repo. Hmm? Very fast to get something like a repo machine. Uh, I, I don't know. I would have to touch the top of it. Another uh, tips for the CNC machine could have been uh, better to fabricate. Um, no, actually, his his tip was actually small enough, but it wasn't delicate enough for the laminate. He didn't. He wasn't used to working with that kind of material, so it just. Room. That's why it came out really rigid and the edges. You mean the cover too rough? Yeah. He, he, he wasn't used to working with it. The person that had, was going to machine it for me.
I mean, in the end, the UV etching was more accurate, but it just took way too long to actually learn how to use it since no one really knew how. So you just got some uh, simulation results and the uh, fabrication and the testing. I got all the pieces, I just couldn't put them together. I didn't have the hardware available. And then you think I get the part of that in another two weeks or so, right? I had actually a friend here, um, Javier, introduced me to someone who actually might be able to do it. But he told me about it on Thursday or Wednesday, so I didn't really have time to schedule something. Well, I did, but next week. Another good job? Perfect. Thank you.